Howdy, Notre Dame fans. It's Mike Singer, blueandgold.com, with Tim Hyde, our resident football analyst, and Ashton Pollard, our staff writer, over at Blue and Gold. Um, Last week for our live show, it was just Tim and I, uh, because Ashton um, had, what, the flu? You, You were out. Yes, I I never figured out what it was, but you can still hear it a little bit in my voice, so sorry. (laughs) Well, (laughs) you guys can hear something in my voice a little bit, maybe. I am also under the weather now, so something's going around, Um, you know, whether you're in uh, Chicago, South Bend, or Atlanta, Georgia. Tim, you feeling okay, buddy? Oh, I'm feeling great. It's uh, 15 degrees outside, snow flurries, life is good. Well, isn't that just dandy for you, Mr. Mr. Hyde? (laughs) Listen, Notre Dame fans, if you're listening um, uh, via podcast, appreciate you guys. Um, le- leave us a kind review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Uh, if you're watching live with us, make sure you hit the thumbs up on this video. Subscribe to our channel if you're not yet. Um, drop us chats, um, you know, super chat, wh- wh- whatever it is. We will um, get your, um, your 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 thoughts up up on the screen and and, and talk a little Notre Dame football here. I, I guess let's just get right into the most recent news item. Uh, it's been a little slow right now in terms of, you know, just what's going on in the world of Notre Dame football, except, and that'll obviously change next week with spring ball starting. I would say except for Jarrett Patterson um, and um, him being out uh, for spring ball. Make sure you guys, if you want more, a little bit more details of the injury and, and whatnot, you can watch our video with, with Tyler Horka where he detailed that, but um, Tim, he, he's going to be out, uh, for spring ball. W- w- what's your reaction when you saw that news? Oh, my, my first reaction was, you know, bad for him. I mean, that's two, that's two consecutive springs. Now he's missed. You know, I know he's a veteran. It's been a starter, all, you know, all the good stuff. Uh, you know, he's been in the program, obviously returning team captain fifth year, all that good stuff. But why did he return? That was, you know, the first thing I thought about is, the man returned to work with Harry Heastan, and now he can't work with Harry Heastan. You know, standing on the sideline with your arm in the sling is not the same as uh, is getting uh, getting uh, reps with Harry Heastan out there chewing your butt each and every down. And that's that was my first instinct was you know I, f- I felt bad for him. He came back for this to train with a uh, with coach who number one learned from Joe Moore obviously, and has, has had two tours in the NFL. And now he's got to sit on the sideline in his sling, hanging out with who's the first game. It's Ohio State, and they don't have little tiny guys up front. So is his strength going to be ready to go? You know, I know there's been reports him coming back for camp, but what's the strength going to be? You know, when he has to go toe-to-toe with those Buckeyes, that those guys don't take days off. So that was all my encompassing first two minutes when I heard about the news. So, you know, really felt bad for Patterson. I, I was in Washington DC when that news broke. So I can't, I can't remember exactly what the injury was. It was it a peck? Does that sound right guys? Yeah. Torn peck. Yeah. It's torn. Yeah. That's, that's no joke. So yeah, you mentioned the strength. I'm like, man, that that's, uh, that's not something ideal. Uh, Tim, any idea on what, the, what the typical time frame for a torn peck is? Well, that's, you know, thank, thank you, Mr. Google. The first thing I did was go on Google and type in, you know, uh, athletes and torn pecs. And, I, you know, it, it depends. Size of guys, receivers, linemen, things of that nature. But he's going to be immobile for, you know, upwards of six weeks. Then, you know, that's after a surgery, which I believe is surgery is this week. If I, if I read right, I think it's Thursday or Friday of this week. And then after that, he's going to be immobile for half a, you know, a month and a half. And then what's the rehab? Notre Dame's got great rehab people. You know, they're going to be unbelievable training with him, but you know, what's that going to be there? And um, you know, is he going to be full strength? When can he start getting that upper body strength to push off? So that's going to be the telltale. And um, if he has to miss a game or two until he's full strength, you know, after Ohio state, it's a little light until they go to a uh, chapel Hill, I believe. Tim, what uh, Tim, I don't know if you watched my video with Tyler Hork. I asked him the same question. Mm-hmm. I'll ask you. Um, what do you do with your first team offensive line for this spring? What, what would that look like for you? Well, I mean, you know, be it, you know, I, I put myself in coach, he stands ho- shoes right away and it's, it's instantly, you know, am I, am I prepared? You know, how do you, pre- you know, I know it's spring ball. You want to do all the intermingling. 
I hope to high heck they don't do what they did last spring, where it's just, you know, you're just going in circles, rotating 22 guys amongst five to five spots. So are they going into this with the mindset of if Patterson can't play Ohio State, who's our center? So we need to figure that out real quick. And are they going to go with, you know, Zeke Carell, who's obviously taken snaps against Alabama in the final four game and, you know, one heck of a center there. So is, is that what they do right away? Or is it, we're, we're going to move a couple other guys around. And, and that's what he stands always been known for is finding, you know, the quote unquote five best players who are the five best linemen and move those guys around. So, you know, you know, you asked me who are the five that are going in, you know, off the cuff, you, you know, me personally, <laughs> I would, you know, I mentioned this, oh, you know, I may ruffle a few feathers, uh, m- maybe starting with you here in about three seconds, but <laughs> I would move Blake Fisher immediately back to left tackle. I, I think that's his spot. He earned it. That was him last year. Move him there. So let's just start that off. That's, that's my take. You know, what do you do with Joe Alt? You know, Christophic obviously is in the mix. And then Josh Lug. Is Josh Lug even going to go in spring? I've, you know, we have, there hasn't been too much what's happening with there. So, you know, you don't have Billy Shralf. So you're going to be with, you know, Rocco Spindler, Baker, Carmody, you know, and obviously the guys that were in, you know, last year's class. I know Coogan, Caleb Johnson have been in the talked about, but realistically, I mean, you got to think those guys are still some project guys when you watch their high school film. I don't know if you actually, you, you, you spoke for about four minutes, Tim. I don't know if you actually answered my question. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So you're very much the president of the Blake Fisher fling, excuse me, Blake Fisher fan club. Joe Waltz, obviously, you know, that, 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 that's me. Ashton, you gotta, you gotta settle the score here between who, who, who we should have, uh, you know, listed on our, um, you know, live show first team left tackle between um, Joe Walt and and, uh, and Blake Fisher, or do you want to throw out a Tosh Baker, or Michael Carmody, and get a little spicy here? I will not be doing that. Although I do like both of them, um, I'll take the I'll take the Matt Bayless approach and say Blake Fisher because he's a genetic phenom, <laughs> which was an article that yeah. Tyler wrote. Todd yep. wrote, I can't remember exactly who, but yes. Um, yeah. Some, yeah. One of them wrote an, an article, Matt Bayless, basically last week was talking about uh, Blake Fisher and everything that he's done and called him a genetic phenom. I love Joe Alt. I think that Joe Alt should have a fan club. However, if I have to pick then Fisher. Yeah, I, I guess it's kind of like a, <clears throat> you can't go wrong. Um, but the thing no, that I keep can't. like going back to Tim is we have no idea yeah. what exactly what Harry he stands going like this is totally n- new I mean obviously he watched uh, uh, I'm sure a ton of Notre Dame football last season he knows these guys you know apparently he was even you know um eating lunch with them every single day and I'm, I'm kidding uh, at least yes. uh, maybe yes. who knows um but well doesn't he uh, still have his house in South Bend yep he's yes. been in South Bend so he was around so he was around Certainly. Could have been. <laughs> Tim, what are you drinking? Uh, I'm drinking a harpoon tonight. I am uh I'm on water for the third week or third show in a row. Um not not a stance or anything like that. It, it's it's just water. It's just I don't think I if I if I drink a beer right now, I think I would just die, like pass out and die. So Ashton, do you have a beverage? Beverage check. I'm drinking um I'm drinking unsweet tea from Chick-fil-A. Oh my god. This is an advertisement. This Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A, can you sponsor our show? Yes, um, yes. Yeah, right please. now. Please. Yeah. Oh my god, please. Hey, real, uh, you know, but you know, to go off a little bit with that, you know, Ashton said real quick is, you know, my reasoning for Blake Fisher is, well, number one, he won the job in the spring, won the job in the summer, and then the guy went toe to toe for two quarters against a potential top 10 draft pick out of uh, you know, Johnson who was the ACC player of the year there out of Florida State, the DN. Johnson didn't have any tackles on him, didn't have any sacks on him, and absolutely stonewalled him, you know, the majority of the pass uh, pass pro times. The guy's out for, what, 100-plus days, and then literally the week before <laughs> the Fiesta Bowl says, hey, can you play right tackle, a spot you've never played before? And he goes out there and just plays his tail off. I mean, he really did. For what he did was, you know, was remarkable. 
And my thing with Alt, I think Alt is very versatile. I think he's a very athletic kid. You know, is he a right tackle? Once again, Mike, you said it perfectly. We have no clue. But one last thing on my reasoning is, I've been going over this, watching the film of last year, is Notre Dame played nobody the last six games. Out, you know, I'm not counting uh, the Fiesta Bowl. The teams they played were all ranked in the 100s in stats. So I'm just going to say, did they really improve? Seriously. And that's just throwing it out there. I know people want to say all Christophic, believe me. They went out there and they played their tails off. But they got no pressure against SC, North Carolina, Georgia Tech, Stanford. These are teams that are in the 90s, hundreds when it comes to every single defensive category. And that's uh, and that was just a little bit of my reasoning when it goes to O line play. I get it. I get your point, Tim. I just, I, I'm like, uh, what happened is, is what happened. I don't, I don't like sure. adding in extra little things to just try to prove someone's preconceived notion on something. Shoot me, shoot me, Tim. No, no, I'm not gonna shoot you. But, but you know, but it's a great point. But all of this, <laughs> you know, hubbub about the offense improved and they did amazing. Yeah. They played teams that were ranked 115th in every statistical category. Notre Dame in year five of the Brian Kelly reboot should be blowing those teams out. So, you know, that, that's the way I look at it. And when they played tough top 10 defenses early in the year, you know, they got they got owned up front. I, I just think that both things can be true. You know, like Notre Dame sure. might have played some weird competition, but also the insertion of Joe Walt and Andrew Christophic changed things. So... Um, you know what? I got to address a comment real quick. Beast Daniel says a koozie for water. Yeah. Like I'm going to be drinking this for like an hour. So I got to keep it. I got to try to keep it a little cold. I don't want keep lukewarm cold. lemon water you know, right now. You know, Mike, and we talked about this during the season. Tim, was... can, Tim, can you, can you stop putting us on topic? I want to go just off the rails here <laughs> and you keep bringing us back on topic. Uh, Ashen. I'll do that. Um, what kind of, is that a spin drift? I have no idea. We got it from Sam's Club. Yes. Spin drift. Lemon one? Is it lemon? Yeah. Have you had the pineapple one? Uh, we that got the a 30 pack from Sam's Club. <laughs> um, Sam's Club's like okay. my favorite place in the world, by the way. I got lemon, lemon. Pineapple one's good. Grapefruit. Grapefruit is too strong for me. It, it's it, yeah. it tastes more like grapefruit juice than it does actually water. Um, but Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Highly recommend the pineapple one. There's my contribution to the segment. <laughs> it. It's all good. Um, <laughs> Sam's Club Pizza, the best pizza in the world, except for Mr. Z's and Key West. Those are the two best pizzas I've ever had. Um, so, don't <laughs> okay. knock it till you try it. That, that's all I gotta say. Okay, back on back on topic for you, Tim. Um, last thing before we move into some other topics here mm -hmm. um, on the offensive line, I've kind of said it in multiple shows here recently that spring's all about development falls all about install, but with the offensive line might be the exception. How important is that camaraderie, that chemistry to build on the offensive line? Like I personally don't think Jarrett Patterson, like we, we know what he is. I don't know if, if he was here this spring, he was able to go all 15 practices. If you know, he's going to take some next step in his game. I think he is what he is. And that's a, one of the best centers in the country. Um, it, it, does it really hurt chemistry that he's out all spring? Well, it does. You know, when you're looking at a new football coach who's coaching him, and you know, the it's just the inner workings that you know he's done. Of course, Patterson has what nearly 40 starts under his belt. I get that. Uh, it's yeah. I mean, it's just it's working with people when you because they have a lot of guys coming back. So that's the other thing, and it's a completely new coach. And it's preparing, you know, I, you know, I, that's a couple of weeks you've talked about spring is for fundamentals true, but you're open up with Ohio state. So if Tommy Reese and Freeman and Al Golden are not scheming and starting to install some stuff, you know, I mean, they need to install some stuff. They only got a couple wide receivers. So they only got a couple tight ends. They better install to see what the heck they could run come August, you know? Yeah, but I mean, it's the same offense that they've been running the past, what, year three of Tommy Reese at OC, so you, you got that going for you, but it's 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 a really good blend of talent on the offensive line with <clears throat> experience. My goal is to finish this show without losing my voice. I think we can do that. We, we will see. 
All right, but it's also a, blue, Mike, Mike, Mike. But it's the offense for the first time. It's Reese. He doesn't have Brian Kelly on his shoulder hanging out. Fair. That's that's a biggie. Fair. I do agree with that, and I think that's a big reason why Tommy Reese stayed. Um, to you know, kind of be the head coach of the offense, essentially. Um, moving along at blueandgold.com today, we had an article. It was our cover three article that we run each Wednesday excuse me, Wednesday morning around, you know, 11 a.m. or so Eastern time. And for this week, the topic was which Notre Dame position group has the most to prove. And I figured this is whatever our cover three topic is we can bring to um, our show here at bloomgold.com. Hit the thumbs up on this video, um, subscribe to our channel and uh, drop any questions, drop a super chat if you want your question answered right away. Um, Ashton, we'll go to you. You actually contributed to this article, uh, as well as Tyler Horka and Patrick Engel, our beat writers at, at Blue and Gold. Um, tell us the position you went with and why. Yeah, so I went with running back, and I kind of looked at this is a very simplistic look because there are a lot of us. We, we talked about when we were picking our groups, there are so many options that you could go with that I think you could make a reasonable argument for. Um, but I went with running back because Kyron Williams – obviously left going to the NFL. Um, He was the, he scored 17 touchdowns. There were 14 on the ground and then three passing touchdowns. And who is going to replace that? And I think that that's particularly important given the questions at, at quarterback and kind of the uncertainty, both at quarterback and with the wide receivers Um, kind of the only, the only surefire pass catcher. I think that really has a lot of experience is is Michael Mayer. And obviously he's not a receiver listed as a receiver, but I mean, kind of the same thing you get my point so yeah I went with um I went with running back just because also I think there's a lot of talent in that room and I talked about this two weeks ago on the live show they have McCullough at their disposal now who's one of the top supposed to be one of the top running back coaches in the country um all of these guys um Tyree sorry Tyree Diggs and Audric Estime have have shown flashes obviously had Tyree has had more time to do so but um Tyree's kind of the, the speed guy I feel like Diggs kind of brings that juice that Kyron Williams bought that like electric like oh my god he just did that type of play uh, you saw that with the hurdle that he did and then SMA is kind of like the bowling ball um and obviously Jadarian Price is coming in too but he's a true freshman so we don't know exactly what he looks like we'll get a look at that next week but um yeah I just think that the biggest the biggest hole now is Kyron Williams being gone so the my choice was running back because someone has to fill that hole and they got to get, um, they got to get started on figuring out who that's going to be. Because as Tim said, they open with Ohio state and that, that defensive line is not going to be very, very nice or easy to them. So they got to, they got to get it together. Yeah. We, we had a question here in you uh, on the YouTube chat, uh, does Sibo Flemister stay or leave? Um, I, I mean, yeah. I, when, when, whenever we do talk about, um, about um, the running back position, we just kind of move over Sebo, um, and yeah. I, I believe he's still on the roster. Yeah, I mean he's he's, he's he's still on the roster, but like I I have a hard time believing that he's coming back. I don't know. I don't have any inside information on that, but based on what I know and kind of what happened last fall with with him, it, I I have a hard time believing he's coming back. But again, I could be wrong. Yeah, the I hadn't heard anything. Except for, I don't know, about January, early January, Notre Dame was, you know, looking at taking the second back. It's kind of like a little bit of an insurance in that 2022 class. It's kind of a little bit of assurance policy if um, SIBO were to go. But, yeah, I, I just feel like we, we, we do mention the four scholarship guys, and SIBO is one of them. But he would make five. Uh, we just kind of gloss over him. But I, I, I'm kind of with you, though, Ashton. I, I – for him going into his what fifth is it fifth year? Yeah, he'd be yeah. a fifth. Yeah, you know, in, in him not, I I can't see him being one of the top two backs on the team. So I mean, is he gonna be okay with taking a you know fifth year and being the number three back? Um, maybe even number four back if Audric Estime passes him up. I personally can't see that, but yeah. Um, nope. a- any other thoughts, Ashen, before we move to Tim? Tim, go ahead. Mr. Hyde, what, what was your pick? Most approved um, position group. And it, I should note, no, it's for this spring. It's not like for, you know, Notre Dame football in, in general. It's just kind of like what, what, what position has the most approved to you when we see these next 
Um, well, no, uh, the media only gets to see five practices, um, but you know uh, the reports that come out of it. You know which, which group has the most proof. Uh, for me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna beat this. You know, I'm gonna beat this down. Which is defensive backs. I am just. I don't think they get talked about enough. I am. I'm nervous uh, because who are the worst? I mean, look at the look at the three best quarterbacks they played last year: Cincinnati, North Carolina, Oklahoma State. They all look like Heisman Trophy guys against Notre Dame's secondary. Obviously, we've talked about the the quarterbacks they're facing this year. You know, you know, instantly you got the three best teams. They're going to face three top ten teams more than likely this year in Ohio State, Clemson. You know, I, I fully expect Clemson to be undefeated when they come to South Bend and USC. So, once again, are these DBs going to step up? There's a lot of guys returning and sometimes people could get excited about that, but is that a good thing? All you have to do is watch, watch those three games and see how they performed. And obviously, you know, we could talk about the festival till we're blue in the face, what happened in the secondary there. And, and those guys are all returning and there's not like a, you know, a bunch of plethoras of superstars coming in to beat them out, which is, which is interesting. So I think that group has a lot to learn. And speaking of SIBO, you know, on the DB side, you have Tariq Bracey. There's another one that he could easily be a grad transfer. You know, Lewis has been the guy. Cam Hart solidified, but does, you know, you know, Mickey come in. You know, obviously you got the freshmen that sat out this past year, you know, and Barnes, Riley, Chance Tucker, who, you know, three really good corners that didn't see the field this year. Spring, you know, they're going to get a lot of reps because they want to see where those guys are before the the 23 group comes in at the secondary. So Bracey's kind of like the SIBO on the defense as well. So it's curious to see where he goes after the end of this spring. And think about Bracey is that like he could slide really well into that nickel spot um, and play a ton of snaps. Mm -hmm. um, but there's only one ball and, and there's typically only one running back in, in a play. And uh, whereas there's five DBs, most plays, uh, on defense so that that would be uh my re my rebuttal there tim yeah no 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 i agree you know but nickel is technically the rover so you know that means you're taking out the rover all the time so is that does that mean is break do you want to see Tariq bracy on the field i mean in a or dime, mark, in a dime you, got both. you got both in a or dime. does mark yeah yeah and dime but that's a completely different package there but now you got and in their dime they always went with the uh, you know they always went with ramon henderson and that and that facet last year, but with Bracy, does Marcus Freeman? You know, are you going to have a five-star Jalen Sneed chilling, who's an SEC linebacker over Tariq Bracy? That's my thinking as spring ball starts. How that plays out in that position? I was just playing devil's advocate, Tim. You're right. I was wrong. Always. <laughs> You're always right. I'm not always right. I mean, always play devil's advocate is what I mean. Yes. I'm just kidding. Yes. All right, yes. mine is. Uh, I think my choice will be a little. We'll get a little eye roll. Um, but it, it's the most obvious answer and it's the best answer. It's obviously quarterback, right? Oh, yes. yes. Was, was it just like too easy for you guys to yes. pick? Hey, and yeah, all I, of just, these questions... I didn't pick it. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Ashton. I'm sorry. No, you're good. I was just going to say, I feel like we can only talk about quarterback for so long until spring practice starts. Like we, I just, I have nothing else to say that's like new or exciting. So it's just like, also, I don't want to. I, I want to leave Steve Angeli for you to talk about. That's another reason. Oh yeah, do we need a a show here? If if we need to fill some time, I can I can talk Steve Angeli. We can talk him for about seven eight minutes. You, you should recite the poem you wrote about Steve Angeli. Oh yeah, on air. You want you want me to do that on air? Uh, you yeah. know what? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm not feeling I'm great. Kidding. Mike doesn't have a poem. <laughs> it's a joke. No, no, no. It's totally Percy. real. I appreciate you trying to cover for me. It's a real poem, but I don't remember. Yeah. Ashton, can you, you can you recite it for for me? Uh, no, I'm gonna let yeah. I'm gonna let you do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, it's got to be. And, and and Rick Mahalik here says I roll. He, he's rolling his eyes at me. But listen, <clears throat> it's the most important position on the field. You have a quarterback battle. You're going on your third different starting quarterback in as many years, and you've got a sophomore who's never started a game and a junior who's never started a game. So, yeah, I'll I'll, I'll take the quarterback um, battle for sure. So, 
you know, I, I, I think it's going to be Buckner. I don't think it'll be named this spring, but I am, I'm not sold that it's going to be Buckner all of the game starting for Notre Dame, you know, knock on wood that it's not injury related, but I, I, I just, I just believe that Pine's going to find his way starting some games this fall. Um, and uh, I think he's going to surprise some people, Tim. Well, I look forward to being surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I, I look forward to being surprised. If, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it right there. I, you know, I've said this. I mean, you just got to go Buckner. He's a better athlete. He o- opens up everything, especially if Reese wants to be a RPO, you know, zone read option type team with the limitations they have at wide receiver. It's probably the best thing to have your quarterback being that dude with the ball, which teams have to account for him. A lot of the run game issues last year, I know we harped on the O line and Jeff Quinn, you know, gets attacked night and day, but come on, not one D coordinator went into the 13 games last year, scared of Jack Cohn keeping it for two yards. Not one time this year, every time that ball is in Buckner's hand, there's going to be a spy on him. D line's going to have to stay in their rush lanes or Buckner is taken off. I, I would uh, play devil's advocate as always, Tim, my, my, uh, my Jack, rebuttal Jack would be, no, my rebuttal would be when is the last quarterback that kept a DC up at night? Like a Notre Dame QB, like who's the last one that oh. like, I mean, Deshaun Kaiser. I mean, Deshaun Kaiser definitely would take off and run. His 2000. No, I'm just talking about as a quarterback in general, like all aspects yeah. of, of quarterback. Deshaun yeah. Kaiser, this was what, seven years ago? Oh, no, exactly. It's been a long time. I mean, Ian, you know, I don't think Ian Book worried people. Now, Ian Book would scramble and keep drives alive. That frustrates DCs, but I don't, I, I don't think they were scared about him keeping on a quarterback draw and things of that nature. And, Wimbush, no one was worried about his arm except for the fades to Boykin and Claypool and, uh, and you know, all the big tight ends they had. But as far as a true runner and a throw, I mean, Buck, you know, Buckner's going to be able to throw some. You know, there's no doubt about that. Yeah, that so it's, it's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah the biggest thing really is that we want to learn is how, how good is Tyler Buckner at throwing the football down the field? Like, he looked fantastic at it his junior season when he put up those crazy numbers, but competition, um, you know, I, I, I don't think there's much um, argument there that it was, a, a, you know, not good. I mean, it just, yeah. it, it wasn't, um, you know, we can argue that, uh, you know, the, the, the college defenses from the point earlier and, but no, nothing in, in small ball, San Diego, um, you know, not, not great competition. So yeah, we will see certainly a, a, a very interesting figure. So let, let's move into another discussion topic here. Um, and combine was just last week for Notre Dame. I'll go off script a little bit to Ashton. Who would you say maybe had the best performance of the Notre Dame guys in the NFL draft? And then anyone for you, Ashton, that, um, you know, maybe underwhelmed a little bit. Yeah, I think best performance hands down is, is Kevin Austin on that wide receiver. He kind of went in as a, as a fringe day three draft pick. You can make the argument that he wasn't going to get drafted. I, I'm pretty sure he now will be drafted. And if he went in round, if he went in the fourth round, like I would, I would not be shocked. I was talking to my dad about that the other day. Um, I don't think he's going to go in the fourth round, but if I heard his name, it would not be the most shocking thing in the world. I think I'll go like five, six. Um, but yeah, he had a great, get a great combine. He ran that 40. Um, the official time came back a little slower. The unofficial was 4.37. And the official was 4.43, which was 14th out of the 32 receivers that ran it. But still a very solid 40. And then when it came to um, a lot of his on-the-field drills, I mean, he was he was performing at a very high level. He was second in the three-cone drill. He was second in the 20-yard shuttle out of um, – that's fewer – they had fewer than 32. I think it was around, uh, like, 15 ish, but I mean, I mean, still, and then as far as his broad jump and vertical, they were both very high. He was uh, fourth or fifth, fourth or fifth out of 30 something. So yeah, I mean, he, he really overperformed, I thought. And then in terms of underperforming, unfortunately, I think it was Kyron Williams and the, uh, the masses kind of agree with that. I was, I was collecting some of the media responses about Williams's performance and they were they were very depressing. I'm not going to lie. Um, I know the draft network actually listed him as like one of their two or three quote losers in the, um, 
in the combine and you can i mean you can you can make the argument that the combine should not have as much weight as it does you can also make the argument it should have more i mean there are varying opinions on that and you can you can again you can be on both sides of that and have a decent argument so um i i don't want to say that that combine performance didn't mean anything but i also think i mean you you watch kyron like he's a he's a magician like we've seen it multiple times he's arguably the most exciting running back that notre dame has had maybe in in my lifetime kind of it since the 2000 ish that he's the most exciting um yeah but i think if you just on paper if you look at how kyron did it wasn't great and um austin was great but again i i i, I think kyron will be just fine wherever he ends up you can as we've learned that We've learned that with NFL running backs, you can you can grab a, a diamond from the sixth, seventh round, whatever. You don't you don't need to take them in the first round, and a lot of people don't take any running back in the first round. So we'll see what happens. But that's kind of my my brief synopsis of last weekend. Yeah, Tim, any any thoughts on these Notre Dame guys in the combine? <laughs> kind of dish it to you. Any thoughts on how these guys looked? Yeah, I mean. I mean, obviously they're numbers. So, you know, scouts and GMs and head coaches want to see those numbers as it pertains now to film. So, but, you know, with Kyron Williams, everyone, you know, when he came out, he was, you know, he was never going to be a first round draft pick. He was never going to be as probably a second round draft pick. I think that's way above because he's, he's a running never back. Showed, what's that? He's a running yeah. back. Yeah. yeah he's, a, he's a running back, but now the numbers now show, okay, well, he's not breaking one in the NFL because, everyone in the NFL looks like a Georgia football player. So, you know, you want to talk about combine, holy moly. It's like, <laughs> I think Georgia won the day. If we're going to talk about who won the day, but um, you know, with Kyron Williams, it's going to be film just like Kevin Austin. Okay. Kevin Austin runs a four, four. Wow. Look at the numbers. He's jumping through the roof and then they put on film and it's like, you know, he has some good stats, but then he disappears most of the time, you know, the Cincinnati game, he's going against NFL corners. That's the game NFL scouts are going to break down is Cincinnati. And where was Kevin Austin? Nowhere. So, you know, so he has stats. Does it parlay to some of the film? With Kyron Williams, he runs slow. But my gosh, you put his film on, he's not going to live in heck out of people. There's there, there can't be a running back who blocks as good as him in pass pro. And that's going to be his saving grace when it comes to the NFL. Yeah, they don't do that at the combine, do they? <laughs> There's no no, uh, <laughs> no blocking. Um, before we actually get into our topic, we're kind of um, you know going off on a, a small tangent here. Um, Tim, what do you think about the argument of well, look at Kevin Austin in these measurements and this forty yard dash and how he looked in the drills? Why didn't he do that at Notre Dame? Is it he's just a really good testing player? Or is it, um, you know, a, a because of the Notre Dame staff and whether it's Kelly or Reese or Alexander, uh, the receivers coach from last year, like it, w I hate to phrase it like this, but who, who gets the blame here after seeing it's a natural reaction. Like, wow, look at these numbers. Why was he not a better receiver at Notre Dame? Well, wasn't he suspended one year? He was suspended one year and he had injuries that cost him, you know, two other years. That's, you know, so you could blame him for the suspension and, you know, he had a foot, he had a foot injury that, that knocked him out. And it's yeah. too bad because those exactly two seasons. So you have, and it's too bad because in those early reports before things happened on his foot and whatnot, all you heard about was him tearing it up in practice and being that guy, I believe Austin was, was you know, top 100 recruit when he came aboard. So there was always those expectations. And I think this year it's a little wrong, maybe sometimes to judge him because he was so rusty. That's why a lot of scouts, you know, you read all the draft reports on him and they're all like, come back. You just, you know, you had almost 900 yards this year, come back, do it again. And you're going to be a solidify, you know, you know, second round draft pick type of uh, football player, which, you know, you go back to all the other wide receivers that have played recently that have been in that uh, case. So, he ch he chose to bet on himself, so to speak, and and we'll see and we'll see what that happens. But the NFL is loaded with guys that run four four five, and he's going to be one of them. Is he going to be skilled enough come camp? Did did he get enough rust off last year to be a guy to earn a spot on a roster? Uh, yep, fair enough. All right, so the guys who Notre Dame had in the NFL Combine: quarterback Jack Cohn, running back Kyron Williams, 
Receiver Kevin Austin, uh, defensive lineman Myron Tongavloa Amosa, safety Kyle Hamilton. So that's a group of five. Is, is there anyone else, Ashton, that could get drafted for Notre Dame that's not in that group, or or is that the is that the the quintet? I'm pretty sure that's the quintet. Okay. Considering a couple of those guys are kind of fringe, be drafted or not, guys. Okay. That I that's my guess. Okay, but, I don't follow that. You know, I'm much more into the recruiting side, so I, I, I that, that was just a question for my curiosity. So, of those yeah. five, and maybe someone who's not in there, but who, who do you guys think will throw it to Ashton first? Um, which player in Notre Dame's 2022 NFL draft class, or you know, undrafted free agent, um, do you think will surprise a lot of people with their performance in the next level? So. I could argue for Austin, but I'll go. I'll go Jack Cohn, and here's why. I think Jack Cohn. He had he had a decent combine. He tested well, um, relatively well. I mean, there were a couple. I was I was covering. Um, we did live blogs every night, and I was doing, I was doing Thursday night, and so I was very intently. I watched all four days, but I was very very intently watching that that first day. And um, Cohn Cohn did very well. There were a couple of off target passes, but you know whatever. Um, I think that. Cone's very, very, very smart. I mean, you never when like that's kind of the first thing, at least I think that you you hear when somebody says like, "Tell me about Jack Cone." Like we, I mean, we talk about how he's mobile, but in terms of like the positives, it's very like he is very intelligent. He wants to learn everything. He'll do whatever it takes to learn everything. Obviously, when you get on the field in the NFL, it's different. But I think as far as like having like Jack Cohn is like a good guy to have in the locker room because he's going to give you everything. He's going to give you everything in practice. He's very intelligent. He's very eager to learn. Um, I think uh, Tyler used this once on a video and I've heard this in other places, but like Jack Cohn could be that guy in eight years that is like career backup sounds bad, but it's like, I mean, if you, if you spend eight years as a backup quarterback in the NFL, like that's not a bad gig. Like uh, very few guys actually do that. And I think that you could hear Jack Cohn's name, maybe six, seven, eight years of like, no, I, I don't think Jack Cohn is going to go out. I don't think he's the next Tom Brady, like six round pick. That's going to be like a Super Bowl winning quarterback. Absolutely not. But do I think that Jack Cohn could have a decent career as a backup and um, is a good guy to have around for all the reasons I just said? I think absolutely. No. Yeah, Ashton, um, you kind of cut out for a second, and all I heard was Jack Cohn's the next that's Tom right. Brady. So I'm, I'm <laughs> guessing. Oh, I'm kidding. <laughs> Did I actually cut out. No. Yeah. <laughs> no, I know. Every time you say Tom Brady, someone's like, "No one's Tom Brady." So I'd like to make it abundantly yeah. clear that's not what I'm saying. Well, when you go, the, compa- yeah, when yeah, you the go- comparison was just yeah. I I know. Go, I'm, go I'm to T- Tim. <laughs> no, I was gonna you know just you know off of that you know when you talk about career backups, I mean you got Gary Kubiak and Jason Garrett. Those guys played as much as us three combined. It were the Cowboys behind Aikman yeah. and uh, Kubiak behind Elway, and they both became NFL head coaches. So. Hey, if he's in the NFL it's for eight years, day. he's got pension for life. So enjoy it, Jack Cohn. I think backup, like third string quarterback, or do NFL teams do they carry third? Or do they just yeah. carry two? Some do. Okay. Usually, I think most do. I know the Giants currently are not. I'm a Giants fan, so that's why I know that. Um, and everyone's kind of like, "What are you doing?" And apparently, they're getting Mitch Trubisky to solve that problem, which is a whole other topic. Oh that yeah. We don't need to discuss, but uh, most I think most have three. Yeah, being a third string quarterback in the NFL sounds like a great job to me. You're making what yeah. five hundred, six hundred thousand a year. You know, oh, yeah. low pressure, just practice, hang out with the boys. Sounds like awesome to me. Um, That's well, what Ian Book's on, doing in New Orleans. Yeah, no. I was gonna say it's awesome <laughs> nice until you get called upon like Ian Book. <laughs> well, fair. Yeah, but yeah, but that was a result of a once in a hundred year pandemic. That's not the norm. <laughs> yeah. 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 But James, no, point taken. Yeah, Jameis Winston got hurt too, but Winston. Um, but yes, yes. my my dolphins. I'm a big uh, were... big big dolphins fan. Um I, I felt pretty bad for uh, Ian Book that game. And um I can't confirm or deny if I'm a betting man, but if I were, I would have laid some money on the Dolphins in the spread. And if I did, then I would have come come out in, on top. All right, here's a good comment here from James. He says, "Uh, the the next Luke McCown." Um, 
that that <laughs> that sounds great to me. Yeah. I think between the McCown brothers, I think they played for like every NFL team. Was there three of them? <laughs> but two, two or three of them. All right, Tim, you're um, actually we'll go to me because I know who yours is, Tim. Yeah. Um, and I want to go first, and it is Marin Tongaloa Mosa for me. Um, and I'll make this quick. Um, so Tim can give his reasoning. Spoiler alert: His choice is also MTA. Yes. Um, I like. I think the tweener thing between being a five technique and a three technique there used to be a bad thing. Um, but now it's like a it's versatility. It's a versatile guy instead of being a tweener between you know strong side end and uh, defensive tackle. So I mean. Four eight one. That's that's a darn good time for someone his size. Um, I think he's going to get drafted. I think he's going to be a fantastic uh, locker room fit. Um, he's just a good dude. Um, you know, you you wish he was, you know, six four two ninety. But you know, overall, he, he's he's a darn good football player, and um, you know, I think he's uh, going to be a, a you know a niche guy. Um, at the NFL and, and and be a backup, but make a lot of money and 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 play for a while. Tim, I agree. That's exactly what I was going to say. He's a locker room guy. He's played three technique, nose guard, the wide side, strong side, D end. He's played it all. He's been a team captain. I mean, the the you know the man's father died, goes back, buries his dad, and he's back instantly, getting ready to play football. He's he's a team guy, and in the NFL. So many of those defenses are so interchangeable nowadays that he's going to find a home. He's going to make a roster somewhere. He's, he's, he's too good of a guy not, not to make it. All right. Uh, moving along. Um, this is going to be a little bit more of an Ashton Tim topic. Um, these two have been following Notre Dame football their entire lives. Um, you know, me more so just the past few years covering uh, Notre Dame football recruiting for blueandgold.com. Um, so I will throw it first to Ashton. Who is your favorite all time uh, Notre Dame football player? Brady Quinn. <laughs> and it's not close. And here's why. So Brady Quinn was the quarterback at Notre Dame from 03 to 06. And he was like, he's kind of like the reason that I'm a Notre Dame fan. I mean, Obviously, my dad going to Notre Dame is that reason, but, like, I started getting into it when Brady Quinn came onto the scene. The first game I went to, I actually looked this up. So the first game I went to was the Notre Dame-Florida State game in 2003. Notre Dame lost 37 nothing, but Brady Quinn was a starting quarterback, and I got to see Brady Quinn, and that was the coolest thing in the world. Um, I looked, again, I was looking at the stats from this game. They had one first down on their first eight drives, so not great. Um, and I still loved Brady Quinn. And I think that that is telling. Um, no, but seriously, like actually Brady Quinn was kind of, yeah, the reason that I, I started like Notre Dame football. I have the same birthday as him. And I would tell everyone that I saw that if they, they didn't have to ask, I would just like tell them. Um, I'm sure they're like, who is this girl? Shut up. But I loved him. Um, and then, yeah, he's, he's like hands down. Like I didn't, when you sent the lineup or, run down whatever i didn't even have to think about it like that that is the reason it's also the first jersey that i owned i'll let tim go now but yeah <laughs> I, I love it i i i it's funny i went to a you know a handful of games brady quinn games uh you know we went to the 05 one when they had to win that game at stanford stanford's last game there and yeah. brady quinn and shamars and them just tore up stanford great shootout went to the fiesta bowl and, uh, and whatnot, saw his sister there when she's, you know, she married AJ Hawk and, uh, you know, wearing that, yeah. the splice Jersey. I remember that, but, yeah. oh, Quinn's 05, 06 seasons are, I mean, those are legendary in Notre Dame, you know, I mean, forever. He's always going to be remembered for 05, 06. So great pick. Cause he's a heck of a, a heck of a quarterback. So anytime you get a guy out of Columbus, Ohio, away from the Buckeyes is a, is a good thing. All right. What's your choice, Tim? Absolutely. You know what? Mine was, I took about, you know, 2.2 milliseconds to come up with mine, just like Ashton. Mine is Chris Zorich. I, Chris Zorich is is the best. He's the ultimate Notre Dame guy. You know, obviously growing up with in the Lou Holtz era, I was a Zorich fan. Uh, I remember uh, 
you know, Lou Holtz. I remember, you know, the, you know, quote about Zorich, you know, he redshirted his, his freshman year in 87 and he's in the locker room bawling his eyes off out. Notre Dame's thinking they have a shot at the national title, lose to Penn State, lose to Miami, lose to AM in the Cotton Bowl. And Zorich is bawling his eyes out in the locker room and Holtz is like, who's that? And they're like, oh, that's Zorich. He's like, find a spot for that guy. And Barry Alvarez moved him from middle linebacker to nose guard, college football hall of fame. And then the one thing that has stuck out forever, you know, this is when I was playing back then we have half shirts. There's some great, great pictures of the Notre Dame D back then used to wear half shirts. So it's Bryant young, Scott Kolakowski and all those guys. And, um, and then there's a great sports illustrated article look up and in the article back then at 89, 90, when it's written about him, he used to lift weights with manhole covers. So we, me and my buddies used to do this. So that was, uh, <laughs> and by the way, they're very heavy and uh, very hard to get. So make sure you don't get caught taking those. But uh, we actually did that. And there's a whole article written about him, which is awesome. So Chris Zorich, I mean, uh, you know, and, and also he was the Orange Bowl MVP and his mother is, is passed away in her, in her home watching the game in Chicago. So. You know, he didn't know about that until after that famous 10 to nine game where Rocket got his uh, putt called back. Um, I grew up a Georgia Tech fan. So when when Ashton brought up Brady Quinn. Yeah, the Georgia Tech game. Mike, you might be muted. You just cut out. Yeah. Uh, that's what happens you're when you're coughing in the background <laughs> and um, you forget to unmute yourself. <laughs> so when Ashton brings up Brady Quinn, this is the yeah, this is the game I think of. Um, was it the season opener? Yep. Yeah. In Atlanta. Yeah, September 5th, 2006. Yeah. Um, so what is that? 16 years ago? Yeah. Um, I would have been in uh, like sixth grade, seventh grade or something. And um, I cried. I cried my eyes out from this game. Um, great season for Georgia Tech, um, but uh, if I remember correctly, or is that the season before? Regardless, yeah, this was uh, this was tough for me. And um, I was gonna say on this topic, the next year, I believe it was the next year, they played again to open the season. Didn't Georgia Tech win like thirty three nothing, thirty nothing, something like that? I was in a, I was in Chicago for a wedding, and I was watching the, hotel, I was watching the game with my dad in the hotel and i remember bawling my eyes out before the wedding about it so charlie charlie weiss started demetrius <laughs> jones at quarterback and i think that lasted for about three minutes and no one ever heard about okay. demetrius jones again yeah. yeah 33 um to three um there, there. 33 three there you go okay now that, now that, that was would be a good bunch of threes you know? That would be a good topic on a show one day. What was more fun, the 2007 season or the 2016 season for Notre Dame fans? So, we'll uh, we'll get into that down the road. How about <laughs> how about no? All right, um, I'm gonna try. <laughs> I'm not sure if this is going to work, but our our, our last topic of discussion here, um, as I try to find it, is this whole Kyle Hamilton and Steph Curry thing. So this this was really interesting. All right, hey Chris. Chris says Mike Goolsby is this one. There you go. You know what? That's my pick, Mike Goolsby. But I'm going with the Mike Goolsby from the Japan Bowl, um, <laughs> and not the Mike Goolsby from his actual Notre Dame days. I'm going with with uh, 26 year old Mike Goolsby. So there's my pick. All right, thanks for that, Chris. All right, um, I'm I don't know if I'm allowed to play this, but. We're, we're, we're just going to do this and um, and see what happens. So this is Kyle Hamilton talking with Colin Cowherd um, about taking Steph Curry in a game of one-on-one. I get bragged on by my family all the time. It may just be me being a little ignorant wanting to respond out of them, but I also say I could beat him one-on-one in a game. <laughs> Steph in a Curry? Game, in a game to 11, just me and him, I don't see him getting around me. Or I'm, I'm going to put my hand as I have about 25 pounds on him. Uh, I think I can get by him. I think I'm more athletic than him. You can't run off ball screen. Can you screen. shoot? Let's see that. No. <laughs> that's my issue. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's sort of the game. If you put the ball in the basket. I can shoot layups. You're not getting it. Okay. Well, Steph, if you're watching this, don't kill me. I think I can get to the basket. I think I can stay in front of him, get a hand up long enough to touch the shot. I, I think if he got the ball first. I'm not touching it. 
can beat you 11-0. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what we said. Uh, we'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to figure that out. Step real quick. All right, so there you go. Um, Tim? Yeah, I'm going to go with Colin Cowherd, 11 uh, nothing. Uh, he sees, yeah, he sees, you know, a lot of Kyle Hamiltons each and every night. So I don't think Steph Curry will be intimidated, especially Kyle Hamilton now only jumped 38 inches. So it's not like he's jumping through the roof to get Steph Curry who wants to hit those rainbow shots. So, and, uh, and whatnot. Ashton. Yeah, I got it. Steph's going to, Steph would be just fine. It's funny. And I love Kyle Hamilton and he's hilarious. And like, the way I kind of wonder how much of that is a joke and how much of it isn't. I'm I'm still not really sure. Um, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. He didn't Marketing. seem like he was joking. He seemed like he at believed. all though. It like, seemed like he believed every know. single word he said. Seems a little split. It seems okay. like he had thought right. about that and. Um, but yes, that, that's uh Well, he definitely had thought about it because he was like, I bring it up to my family all the time. I was like, what goes on? His I, he only has the one brother, I think, right? I know he has one. I think his it's dad was one. a professional like, basketball he was just, player. So was he? Okay. Well, his brother played basketball at William and Mary and at Penn. So I know that his brother played basketball, but I thought I'm sure that's a hilarious dinner conversation. William and Mary and Penn he played at? Yeah. Yeah. Those are those are some those are some schools that you have, you know, that that you know. In your home state, and yeah, then you went indeed. to Penn. You were a swimmer at Penn, which I, people need I to know. I did. Man, Do rough. they? <laughs> yeah, I mean. No, they don't need to know. <laughs> you're a college athlete. Okay. New so. new topic, please. Sam, what was you. your what was your highest level of uh of athletics playing? I uh, played a uh, uh, you know when you were college football, and then after that, uh, went into the Marines, and then uh. Played on a travel team when you're in Japan, which speaking of Japan, Goolsby played on a travel team when I was over there. It was absolutely awesome. It was awesome. Tim Hyde, rock star. <laughs> I love this guy. All right. Well, we are going to, for, for me, by the way, it was just high school, but that that's uh, neither here nor there. All right. We're going to wrap this thing up. Appreciate you guys watching. We'll be back next week. It'll be the day before spring ball starts. We will dive all things uh, Notre Dame spring football. Make sure you hit the thumbs up. Um, check us out on our website, blueandgold.com dollar for the first year of premium access. Appreciate it. We will catch you guys next time.